Holy God, let my words be your words, and when my words are not your words, let your people be wise enough to know the same. Amen. Would you rather be right, or would you rather be kind? This question has permeated my life for the last at least decade and a half. Often, I know how I want to answer that question, that I want to be both right and kind, but my actions often belie my intentions. I mean that in an attempt to thread the needle of being both right and kind, I bungle the whole thing, and I end up being neither kind nor right. I know you may be shocked, but your priest (laughs) is, after all, a human being. Jokes about my humanity aside, you may be surprised that in seminary, students sometimes spend time discussing this very question in pastoral theology class. It's helpful for me to remember that one of the underpinnings of good pastoral care practices is figuring out the best approach to this question, how to be right, or would you rather be right, or would you rather be kind? When my phenomenal professor, the Reverend Dr. Kathleen Russell, uh, well, she was quick to point out that sometimes even the best of us miss the mark, that all of us at times are wrong and mean. And through her blunt Western New Yorker approach to educating, I observed my beloved teacher challenging me to see that the work of pastor, preacher, and priest is not simply espousing godly wisdom in a harsh, critical way, but instead, the role of a clergy person is to lovingly hold up mirrors to a congregation, a community, and a world in need. These mirrors do help us to see the truth of who we have been, who we are, and who we are becoming. But as I share these reflections, I am, and we are to do so, from a foundation of loving kindness. This sort of reflective work is delicate, to say the least. Still here in this tender space of wondering how to be and how to be kind and how to share what is right, here on this holy ground of taking a truthful look in the mirror, I know that God is with us, just like how God was with the Ephesians in the epistle that we heard this morning. Today's portion of St. Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus is an all-timer. It's so chocked full of goodness that it's hard to know where to begin. But let's start at the top. This early church evangelist and letter writer, Paul, had here reached a climactic moment in his correspondence with the Ephesians. For three years, Paul lived among this community, and in this note, he was writing to them from prison in Rome. For three chapters, Paul shared the good news of God in Christ Jesus and how it applied not just to the people of Israel, but to the Gentiles, that is, to all people, including us. Then here in the, chap- in the fourth chapter, Paul pivoted to exploring how this gospel had an implication in the Ephesians' lives. He was holding up a mirror for this church to understand the truth in love. St. Paul displayed kindness in how he shared the truth, though. In this passage, he did not demand. He did not ask. Instead, he begged. He begged them to lead a life worthy of the calling that each one of them had received. Perhaps hastened by his own imprisonment, Paul was desperate for this missionary church, which he had helped start, to get this message. What was this truthful message Paul was striving so hard to gently relay? Well, that they were one. That they were one. That they were united in the spirit in a bond of peace. And because of this union, they would be wise to act with humility, gentleness, and patience. For the truth is they were, and we too are, of one body and one spirit. We have one hope in our calling. We have one Lord. We share in one faith, and there is one baptism into which we are all baptized. There is one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. This is the ultimate truth. There's one God, and that one God is above is both above all things and in all things. 
If your head is spinning, I hope your heart is not. I hope your heart is full because this is really, really good news. But before you think that this is some attempt to blur us all together in an amorphous blob, we get to this crucial phrase. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. All of us have received Christ's giftedness through God's grace, favor unearned and undeserved. You can do nothing to earn more of it. You can do nothing to mess it up. It's pure gift from God. Of course, if we are too consumed with other things, we may not see the gift that is right in front of us or rather right within us. And you may be wondering what it means for each of us to receive the giftedness within us. Well, there's a short list of who we may become through God's gifting. Paul laid out the following. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Well, here at Holy Apostles, all of us are apostles. All of us are sent to share the good news with those whom we meet. Some of us additionally are prophets, not ones who predict the future, but ones who share the truth in love, even to those who are in power and may not like that truth. Some of us are evangelists, which is not street corner preachers who are yelling at folks or televangelists grifting folks out of money, but heralds of good news, like how Mary Magdalene on Easter morning ran and told the other disciples of the empty tomb. Some of us are called to tend to others as pastors, not being the good shepherd, but one who works for him. Others are ones who are to teach how to live out our faith in God. Now, this list is not exhaustive. There are many other roles to play. And what truly matters is what comes next in Paul's letter. All of us are called to live into our calling as members of the body of Christ. Each one of us has a role to play. We are to build one another up as we equip the saints. And all of us are saints, just like all of us are apostles. Now, you may not already know the following, but our Bishop Glinda and a wonderful team are actively working to prepare our diocese for our next chapter of shared ministry. And they're doing that through a capital campaign entitled Equipping the Saints. That's exactly what we are meant to do as a church in the way of Christ. We are to equip one another to live our lives as saints of God. And we are to kindly share the truth of how we can grow in God's grace as we mature into the full stature of Christ. We do this together as the body of Christ, and yet each of us has an important role to play as individual members. We work both in a particular area and as an interconnected part of a larger body. Now, as we go, we are sustained not simply by the food of this world, but also by the living bread, which feeds us not just for a moment or for a morning, but for a mission, a lifelong journey to reflect how God dreams this world can be. What's that look like? You may be wondering. Well, Paul put it this way. We must speak the truth in love. We must grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. We must work together to grow in God's love. In our gospel story, love looks like abundant spiritual sustenance in the form of a continuing and glutinous, not gluttonous, passage. Now, you may recall that last week's lesson described how Jesus turned five loaves into enough to feed 5,000 men, which did not include women and children. That number probably grew to about 10,000 people. So this young boy gave five loaves and a couple of fish, and Jesus turned it into enough for 10,000. The power of this good news is not only that God in Christ Jesus could feed the masses, but that a little child was willing to share his food with others. One interpretation of the feeding of the 5,000 portrays others seeing the boy's example and then following suit. Can you imagine? Here a child held up a mirror showing the way the world could be, and everybody else followed suit in being generous. 
All of us are indeed to go and be these sorts of members of the body of Christ. And in just a moment, we'll recognize one such member, and I imagine she does not like that I'm singling her out. But Julia Sanford, who's been a longtime member here, is headed off to Swanee's School of Theology to be formed as a priest in the Episcopal way. Julia, you are like that boy during the feeding. And you are offering up what you have so that God may bless it and multiply it. And as she goes, and as we go, may we strive not only to be right, especially in this tense election season, but may we also aim to be kind. May we hold up loving mirrors to one another. May we be like Paul, trusting that we are called. May we be like the Ephesians, faithfully striving to accept our call as members of the body of Christ. May we be like Julia and that little boy from the feeding, offering up our lives to be taken, blessed, transformed, and then given back to us, changed. And when all else fails, may we seek Jesus like the crowds, flocking after him, so that we are fed not just for a moment or for a morning, but for a mission that will take exactly one lifetime.